Hello, welcome to video seven, which is uh, about the price mechanism. This, this uh, phenomenon of, of demand and supply coming together in a market and deciding what will be the price and what will be the quantity. Um, it's a real fundamental in economics and it's at the basis of, of all allocation of resources uh, in free markets. The price mechanism, the market mechanism, uh, market forces, you might even call it uh, the invisible hand, which is a phrase that Adam Smith used uh, in 1776 in his book, The Wealth of Nations. Whatever you call it, uh, it's something you have to understand uh, what it is and how, it's, and how it's operating in markets. So let's start with the definition. The price or market mechanism is the phenomenon of the interaction of the market forces of demand and supply to reach an equilibrium price and quantity in a market such that any and all demand is satisfied and all supply is sold. In this way, the best allocation of limited resources is achieved. That's the definition. Let's think about this question uh, to show you how the market mechanism operates. How many shoe shops are there in London? Who knows? certainly more than five and certainly less than a hundred thousand but there must be some exact number at this moment in time of say shoe shops in say London but no one decided that there isn't some government committee that said there must be four thousand shoe shops in London no more no less no it was the market mechanism that decided that Londoners and people visiting London Re require that many shoe shops. Let's imagine we did this and we, we could search out and research and find out that there were in fact 4,000 shoe shops in London. That must be a product of the demand for shoes in London such that 4,000 individual entrepreneurs decided whether they're part of a large chain of shoe shops or whether they're individuals to put together some land, some labour and some capital, some limited factors of production, put them together, pay for those factors of production and, and provide supply shoes for the public. Perhaps there were less than 4,000 originally and there was so much demand that it alerted, it sent signals to other suppliers to stop doing whatever they were doing and go into the shoe shop market or perhaps there were too many shoe shops and some simply couldn't get enough business to justify their employment of land, labour and capital to pay for the land, labour and capital. They didn't get enough revenue and they closed down. And it was the demand for shoes interacting with the suppliers of shoes which took the market to an equilibrium position such that there were 4,000 shoe shops in London. That might rise, that might fall according to changes in demand and supply. But the figure, whatever it is, say 4,000 that was reached, was a product of the price mechanism. So, the price mechanism provides signals to buyers and sellers who can respond to shocks and changes that lead to an efficient reallocation of limited resources. When demand or supply changes, it is the market mechanism that, that alerts the, demand, the demanders and the suppliers of what's changed and leads the market to the new best allocation of resources. It might be more, it might be less. We'll look at an example in a minute. The price mechanism allows new equilibrium prices and quantities to be reached when some variable changes. And it's happening constantly. It's happening all the time. But let's look at one simple example. Here we have the market for fur coats, and here we have the mar market for plastic coats. Both the markets are in equilibrium, uh, and they both have an equilibrium price of P1 and a, a, a quantity of Q1 in their respective markets. Now something changes. Perhaps it's a demand side factor, perhaps it's a supply side factor, but something changes and that leads to the reallocation through the price mechanism of resources in this small economy. 
Let's imagine that people's awareness uh, of animal rights and the way animals are treated is heightened in some way. Perhaps a television documentary um, shocks the country and the public as to how uh, animals for fur coats uh, are treated in animal fur coat farms or whatever, wherever these, uh, this fur comes from. And that has an effect on the demand for fur coats. And of course it would reduce the demand for fur coats as people's awareness of the rights of such animals um, is heightened. And we can show that, of course, by a fall in demand. So demand would shift downwards to D2. The price mechanism takes us to a new equilibrium point here. And we have a new price, P2, and a new quantity, Q2. However, there's likely to be a knock-on effect in another market, let's say the market for plastic coats. Some people need, needing coats are no longer willing to buy fur coats. That's what's happened in the fur coat market, and the demand has fallen, the price has fallen, the quantity has fallen. Those people may instead wish to buy plastic coats rather than fur coats. So we're likely to see in this market, the plastic coat market, a rise in demand. Because plastic coats are acting as a substitute for fur coats. And that raises the price, and that raises the quantity supplied to Q2. What's happened is that some of the limited resources in the economy have been reallocated out of fur coats and into plastic coats. Now stop and think what that means. It literally means, as the demand for fur coats fell, suppliers of fur coats got the signal that demand was falling and chose to supply a, a lower quantity, fewer fur coats, to the market. We see that with the drop of quantity supplied. When the price fell, that was the signal to suppliers of fur coats to reduce the quantity they're supplying. But what does that mean, to reduce the quantity of fur coats they're supplying? It does, of course, mean that they reduce the quantity of factors of production employed in this industry. So some factors of production were freed up uh, because they were no longer needed, because fewer fur coats were being made. What, well, that means, literally, that land, labour and capital in the fur coat industry, being employed in that fur coat industry, was reduced. And this means, of course, that some workers were made redundant from the fur coat industry, and some land was no longer used, perhaps a factory where they made these fur coats, perhaps one of the farms where they have these animals for their fur closed down. Land, labour and capital was freed up. But in this industry, plastic coats, land, labour and capital was increased. More land, labour and capital was used in the plastic coat industry. In a very simple example, perhaps the very people who were made redundant in the fur coat industry got, received employment in the plastic coat industry. Perhaps a fur coat factory closed down and reopened as a plastic coat factory. So the, so the land, the labour and the capital gets reallocated across the industries. And that's the price mechanism reacting to falls in demand and rises in demand. And it could happen with changes in supply as well. I want you to see the reallocation through the price mechanism, the signals were sent. Let's look at a slightly more complicated uh, example just to show you that it isn't limited to just two industries. Let's start with the market for fresh fish. Now, I linked the market of fresh, for fresh fish to various markets. And let's see what happens in the market for fresh fish. Um, imagine this. Imagine that fish farmers, because I want to show a supply side event now, fish farmers are faced with uh, restricted um, laws that, 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 to protect fresh fish in, in, in the seas and the oceans. The, fa the fishermen are um, uh, faced with new laws which make it more difficult for them to catch fish. I don't know what it can mean, special new nets, or um, maybe they're just not allowed to, to catch as many fish. So in some way they're restricted. This is going to raise the costs of production for the fish farms. And we show that with an inward shift of the supply curve, raising the cost of production. So S1 shifts to S2, and it raises price that's the new price from P1, goes up to P2, and it reduces the quantity of fresh fish. 
the signal, thanks to the market mechanism, the signal has been sent in the fish market that the cost of production have risen, this raises the price, and that's a signal to people who buy fish, the demanders, and they reduce their quantity demanded. We're moving along the demand curve from there to there, reducing the quantity demanded. But that, through the price mechanism, the signal of higher fish prices leads to those people who were buying fish to perhaps buy something else now, a substitute for fish. Now that might be beef. So perhaps the beef industry sees a rise in the quantity demanded. But that's a signal to beef farmers to increase the quantity supplied of beef. And it raises the price of beef as well. That might have an effect on the mustard market. If people are buying more beef, well, they'll buy more mustard as well because mustard goes very nicely with beef. It's a complement. They're in joint demand. And that increases the demand for mustard. And so that's a signal to, market, uh, to the market in the, of, for mustard for the suppliers to increase their quantity. That goes out to Q2 and the price of mustard goes up. All because fishermen had higher costs of production. And meanwhile, in other markets, there might be an increase in the demand for chicken, sending a signal to chicken farmers to increase their quantity supply. In the, in the market for fishing boats, which of course are produced by somebody, well, there's going to be less demand for fishing boats because fewer fishermen have work. And in the market for potatoes, for fish and chips, there might be less demand for potatoes. So you see that it, it happens across lots of different markets, and even these markets then have a reaction to other markets, and so on and so on. And, and, and these ripples ripple outwards across the economy when something happens in the market, in one market. It sends ripples out across other markets, uh, and that's the price mechanism, sending signals to the suppliers and demanders across many different markets as they reallocate resources. Fewer fishermen here, but more workers needed in the beef industry, and more workers needed in the mustard industry. So maybe labour will get reallocated out of the fishing industry and out of the fish boat building industry and into other industries like beef farming and chicken farming and mustard farming. And maybe workers will lose their jobs in the potato industry, but they will pick up maybe work in other areas. So you see, the price mechanism is informing buyers and sellers constantly about changes in markets and it leads to the reallocation of our limited resources. But who decides these allocations of resources? Nobody. It's no planning committee. It's no government committee. In the free market mechanism, no individual group of people are deciding this. And yet, in a way, everybody is deciding. As consumers and producers, we are all reacting to the signals of changing price and deciding whether as consumers, whether we will or won't buy more or less, and as producers, whether we should go ahead and produce more or produce less and re-employ the limited resources in another way. So there we are, that's the price mechanism. Deciding the allocation of resources and also reallocating resources constantly to find new prices and quantities as a result of changes that are happening all the time in many markets and in markets connected to markets. Okay, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.